Hello all, welcome to module 2, Introduction to Shell Coding. So finally we are there and in this video we will look at shell coding basics. Now if I were to define shell code uh, in a very easy to understand way, it's basically machine code with a special or specific purpose. Examples could be spawning a local bin asset shell, binding to a port and then spawning a shell when someone connects to that port from the outside world, creating a new account on the machine and tons of other such things. Now the most important thing about shell code is because it's in the machine code format, it can be executed directly by the CPU. No further assembling, linking or compilation of any kind is really required, which means it can be consumed in its current form by a CPU and executed. Now how is shellcode delivered? Broadly there are two ways. One is as part of an exploit. Uh, you know, you've heard about a lot of payloads when you use Metasploit such as reverse TCP. Uh, payload, add account payload, uh, you know, creating a shell payload, etc. These are examples of shell coding being used for payload creation. And in this case, the size of the payload is very important. And typically, smaller the size of the shell code, the better. One of the other things of importance in here is something called bad characters. Now bad characters really are those characters which uh, if they are part of the shell code may prevent running the exploit entirely which is your exploit may fail uh, simply because of that character being there. The most common one is the null character or 0x00 and typically while shell coding this is one character which we will almost always avoid. There are other bad characters possible as well and it depends entirely on the program you're exploiting and the specific exploitation conditions uh, you know which you need to analyze. Later on I'll give you a link for a couple of free videos I had created for exploit research where some of this is explained more. The other way to deliver shell code is to basically add it into an executable. Uh, this could be then running the shell code as a separate thread or overwriting the original executable's functionality in entirety. In this case, size of the shell code and bad characters are typically not a concern. Now, the important thing is that in this series, we are going to concentrate on shell code creation and not exploit research which is a much larger and bigger topic. However, once we do other assembly language courses, I will launch a course entirely on exploit research on Linux and Windows, where you would get a taste for all of that. Shell code resources. I think in my personal uh, experience, shellstorm.org is probably uh, the best place. You also have shell code listed on exploit db and on project shell code. Check out all of these resources. Uh, we'll be using some of the sample shell code in some of our videos from these resources. So let me show you how one of these sites looks like. So this is shellstorm.org and this is the shell code listing. If you notice it's listed by operating system and if you click on the Linux one uh, you would actually see a ton of Linux shell codes available here for different purposes. The first one, for example, is for remote port forwarding. Second one is exec v ch mod on etc shadow. The third one is exec v bin asset shell code. Let me open this up in a new tab. Now, basically, as I mentioned, shell code is nothing but the end machine language, which is the opcodes of all the instructions which you're using. And this is where the author has specifically mentioned the instructions which he's using. Uh, this is an AT&T assembly. And then 
this is the finish shell code for that assembly right so now the question really arises that while we are shell coding how do you test your shell code right so to test our shell code we need a skeleton program which eventually will pass control to our shell code to execute and that would allow us to analyze if the shell code has properly executed and done its tasks or not. Now, the most common form of that program is a simple C file uh, where basically you go ahead and define your shell code as an unsigned character array and then pass control to it. Now, here you may notice a lot of interesting pointer arithmetic happening. And what I'm going to do is, I will not explain this from a C programming perspective. Rather, let's take an example shell code from shell code storm and then use it and then analyze what is happening in this program, right? So let's go to shell storm and let me copy the shell code out. And I'm going to go to this program and all of this, by the way, is defined or is available in SLE slash shellcode directory. So you have shellcode.c. Now this is the place you need to place your shellcode in. Let me paste it in. There you go. Now let's compile the program. So we are disabling the stack protection uh, as well as we specifically mentioned that we want the stack to be executable. Now these are just creating conditions so that our shell code can run without any problems. Uh, in a real world scenario, of course, the exploit conditions would dictate as to how you would do things like uh, disabling DEP and things like that, right? So let me compile this. And now let me run the shell code. And I'm just kind of hoping I have put this in correctly looks okay shell code size mentioned here was 23 bytes I think we missed a couple from what it looks like. Let me just copy this back again uh, because our program says there are only 21 bytes. Seems to be wrong. Yes, I think we missed a couple of bytes in here uh, while copying. Problem of copy pasting. I think 31C0 what is what was missing. I'm sorry about that. Okay, they should fix it. Let me quickly compile this again. And there you go, we have our shell, right? Now, I could pretty much cut out some of the problems which happen when we do the videos, but they are intentionally kept in, right? The reason is not because I'm lazy to shoot it again. Uh, the reason is these are all smaller mistakes which happen while doing all of this. So you need to take care as much as I would need to take care of them, right? Anyway, so fantastic, we have a shell, right? So now let's go ahead and analyze how this little C program in here allowed us to test the shell code, right? So let me load up our little friend GDB in quiet mode. Set this assembly flavor to Intel. Let's break on main run the program, disassemble, right? So there's a bunch of thing happening here. Uh, what we are interested in is, if I were to look at the C file, 
is really, you know, when control eventually passes to code and this starts executing. Now, if you notice here in the top, we really have a printf which is calculating string length and a little bit of analysis would basically tell you that, you know, a bunch of stuff we are kind of doing in here uh, allows us to figure out uh, some of the things which we want. However, the interesting part kind of comes in here, which is call EAX. This is really the place where what is happening is we are going ahead and loading up the address of the location where our shell code is stored and we pass control to it. Now let's go ahead and print the address of code. Right? This is the value. And if you notice, this is what is basically being moved onto the stack. And then after that, if you want to go ahead and notice what is kind of in there, you could basically go ahead and use the examine command. Multiple ways to do this. Let me go ahead and use the examine command. And let me give this address. And we have basically, if you kind of start noticing at this address, what you really have is this code all inverted. Can you see that 31 C 0 50 68, 31 Z 0 50 68. So really, if you go ahead and now disassemble or sorry, go ahead and examine this in the form of individual bytes. Let's do 23 of them. You would actually notice that this is exactly the location where our shell code is, right? 31C05068, you have 31C05068, 2F, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at the disassembly, uh, eventually call EAX basically calls this specific location. Let me set up a breakpoint in here so that we can ensure that that is exactly what is happening, which is our hypothesis is correct. We continue running the program. We've hit breakpoint two. We are here right now. And if I now look at the contents of the EAX register, Oops, you would notice that this is really nothing but the address of the location where our shell code is loaded. So which means call EAX now would end up calling our shell code, which would be this location. Let me set up a breakpoint for this place. Let me continue. Hit breakpoint three. Now we are hitting disassemble, and now you would notice that this disassembly in here, ZOR EAX, push EAX, blah blah blah, is really nothing but the shell code, right? You have ZOR EAX, push EAX. So this is in AT&T syntax, uh, while the output which we see here is in Intel syntax simply because that is what we told GDB to do. Fantastic. So now the rest of our shell code goes ahead and executes and gives us a bin asset shell, right? Now in forthcoming videos, of course, you're going to learn how to create this shell code on your own. Hopefully in this introduction video, two things are clear. Uh, you know, what is shell code, how it looks like, and how do you use the skeleton program which I showed to run and test your shell code. And I would really recommend in the beginning to cut paste a lot of shell code available on shellstorm.org to get a feel for what different shell codes do. Of course, you're probably thinking it wouldn't be a really good idea to run other people's shell code when machine code isn't entirely readable as to what is happening in the background, right? For all you know, it's a remove RF star shell code. 
So run it in a sandbox. Hopefully most of the shell code and shell storm etc. has been tested. If not, definitely don't run it on a production machine. Run it inside a VM exactly the way which I am doing right now. Right? Fantastic. So that's all for this video. Thank you.